I have three daughters and yeah, they do do that. They go into each other's closets. Uh, but when the, when the one whose closet they're going into is not at home and then they see each other like at church and then they're like, hey, those are my shoes. But then it's in a public setting and they can't do anything about it. But I don't think guys do that. Do, do, do men do that? I've got a brother. I've never been when I go to his house. I don't go into his cupboard and then wear his shorts. I don't know. It's just not a thing. Well, good morning, everyone. It is wonderful to be together. Um, if you're visiting, um, we have been uh, feasting on the book of Romans, which is a long book, but it really has been a feast and we almost at the end. This is the second last one. So if you have a Bible, um, you can turn to Romans chapter 16. If you don't have one with you, that's fine. You can share with someone next to you. It's quite a long passage. Um, this morning is called part of the family, part of the family. Romans chapter 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Caesarea. Caesarea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend, Eponetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus our co-worker in Christ and my dear friend, Stachius. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Astrobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Trophina and Traposa, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend, Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet uh, uh, Asyncritus, Asyncritus uh, Phlegion, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologus, that's a great name, huh? <laughs> Philologus, Julia, I love that name. One of my daughters is Julia. Neuritius uh, and, and his sister and Olympus and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, you might, after that long passage, greet this person, greet that person, be asking the question which I asked, God, why did you put this here? It's just a list of names. And that would be a good question to ask. Um, God, what were you thinking when you put this in the Bible? And that's a question that I've asked my parents. Parents, what were you thinking when you gave me my middle name? What on earth were you up to? It's a very strange name, or kind of strange. If you don't know it, don't worry, you're not going to know it. Um, you can come and ask me later and I might tell you. Um, but the same question you can ask, 
You can ask God. We were singing um, the last song. Your name is higher than anything else. And I was just thinking, as we were singing that, I was thinking about the world in, in which we're living now. Two major wars and then lots of other conflict wars around. The most powerful nation, or they claim to be, in the world are having elections soon. There's, there's all sorts of strife everywhere. And yet we can know that we serve a God whose name is above it all. And thinking about that, the, the grandeur of that, but He's a God who is personal. You are not a bunch of faces in a sea of a crowd. You have a name and God knows your name. He is a personal God. He, he knows these people. Some of these people we could call, we could call hidden heroes. He cares about what you are worried about. The gospel and building church is deeply personal to God. These people don't have a song or a book written about them, and you probably don't either. But you're not invisible. You're not unseen to God. The God of the nations knows you by name, and He loves you. He has got things prepared in advance for you. We're going to look at the verses kind of in order, but some of them will kind of rush over. Others will spend a bit more time. Verse 1 and 2, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon uh, in the church of Sincera. I ask that you receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of His people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people including me. Phoebe was a prominent woman in the church. She was a deacon, or some translations say a servant, which is what a deacon is. And she was traveling to Rome, probably entrusted with the very letter to the Romans, with this letter. And I love the language that Paul uses. I commend to you. I commend to you. Can I recommend this woman to you? Can I compliment her to you? I want to cheer for her. I want to honour her. There's no us and them. There's no um, this woman is coming to you. No, she is loved and trusted and known by Paul. Hello, and so is she. Well, to God, probably not to Paul. Um, Paul has a deep affection and love for her, and he commends her. He wants the church in Rome to treat her in the same way. I read a history professor who said this, ancient Rome was a macho society, often uh, misogynistic, where women did not enjoy equal citizen rights. And I thought, when I read that, I thought, wow, not much has changed in 2,000 years. We know we live in a broken society where so often women are not treated as equals. But God is inviting us, and especially us men who are Christ followers, to be different. Not just that we don't cause violence against women, but in our very speech, and our speech comes from our hearts, and especially when we allow God to change our hearts, we bring honor to women, we uplift them, we listen to them, we respect women. Proverbs 15 says, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Ephesians 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
I'd love to call Jubilee men. Is that okay, woman? I want to call Jubilee men to speak in this way about women, not in an unwholesome way, but not just in the way you speak or treat, but that we would be examples to one another as godly men. That when we see another man talking in an unwholesome or offensive way, either to a woman or about women, that we would call them out on it and be Christ-like. Not in a harsh way, but in a loving way so that we can correct them and help them to see that women deserve to be honored. Paul models this respect, uh, this respect and honor, not just here, but all through his letters. And then in verse two, we see that Phoebe has uh, been a benefactor of many people, including Paul. What that means is that she was generous with her money. We know that Paul was a tent maker through various seasons of his life. And it took me a while to realize, I just thought tent maker was, a, was another word for, oh, he worked. And then I realized, no, he actually made tents. I love that. God is saying, do camping. It's good for you. <laughs> That's a word for you, Wes, who doesn't like camping. But there were, other, there were other seasons, particularly where Paul was traveling, visiting churches, planting churches, preaching the gospel, where he needed people to fund him. Phoebe was one of those. She had the gift of generosity. Many people in Jubilee have the gift of generosity with food, with money, with gifts, cards, snacks, your resources, your time, your care, you might not have the gift of generosity, but you're still called to be generous. You are still called to be generous. As elders, we are so thankful that Jubilee is a generous church. It is. This past gift offering, just, uh, what was it, five weeks ago, six weeks ago, we are so thankful that it was such a faithful joy to be able to give. You, uh, these passages came out, but I just wanted to remind us again. Malachi 3 verse 10 says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Luke 6, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. It is only with our regard to giving where God actually says, test me. He doesn't say that about anything else. A tithe is generally 10% of our earnings or money that comes in. And I want to challenge us that if you have not been in the habit of tithing, of giving 10% to the Lord, or perhaps you've got out of the habit of tithing, I want to invite you to start that again. This is not a, it's not a, a ritual, oh, Jeremy says, I'm just going to do it. No, this is a faith step. It's a lordship step. You are saying, by doing this, you are saying, God, I, all of me belongs to you, and all that I own belongs to you as well. It is a faith step. I want to, um, through this passage, I'm going to I'm going to honor a few people in a way kind of like what Paul is, is doing. Um, and there's so, so many generous people in Jubilee. Uh, the, the, if I put photos up, the screen would just be full because 
We're a generous people that reflect God's generosity. Don't miss out on that by holding back. Allow God to be the Lord of all that you are. Verse three says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Priscilla and Aquila were a couple who were originally from Rome, but in Acts 18, we read this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. So Priscilla and Aquila got kicked out by Claudius. They got kicked out of Rome with many, many other Jews. Paul calls them his co-workers or servants in Christ. And more than that, they risked their lives for him. They're probably one of the most famous couples in the New Testament. Couples serving together in church is a beautiful gift for the church. When Michelle and I got married, we thought we were exactly alike. And as we've got to know and love each other, we've realized that our love for each other has grown, but we're actually very different. And the way that we serve really complements each other. And we're serving together, but there's a complementary uh, thing that's happening. God is doing something. It is incredible to see couples in Jubilee who are serving alongside one another, displaying God's beauty as you serve others. If you're a couple here, I want to invite you to ask yourself, or maybe ask God, what can I do to serve myself and in, uh, serve my spouse and encourage them to serve in the gifts that they have? Not what can I do to help them be more like me? Paul says that they risked their lives for him. Priscilla and Aquila's marriage was one that experienced risks. I wonder who was more of the risk taker, Priscilla or Aquila? And who was the one that was more aware of the dangers? But whoever it was, they were together serving God. I wanna show you a photo of a couple. You know that couple? Very, very different people, but together they have been serving in Jubilee for, for decades. We honor you guys, Mike and Jenny. Verse five, we see that they hosted the church in, the, in their home. Priscilla and Aquila hosted the church in their home. So. In Rome, um, what happened is the church spread and grew. They probably didn't have many venues like this where the church would meet and they would meet, kind of multiply, like life groups into people's homes. One of the things that marked the early church and the church in Rome was their care for outsiders. In other words, people that weren't part of the church would be invited into their homes and therefore would experience Christian hospitality, Christian love, Christian warmth, friendliness, generosity. We all know that to be hospitable is to welcome people into your home and make them feel at home. But I wanna push that a little bit further if you have got the gift of hospitality, and all of us have got a small measure of it, and some of us have got a big measure of it, if you've got the gift of hospitality, that gift doesn't just stay at your front door when you leave home. What about being hospitable in your workplace, being friendly, being welcoming? 
in your street, in your community, at varsity, at res? What about on a Sunday morning at church? How can you be hospitable to others? As humans, we are people of habit. You kind of sit more or less in the same area. I know that if I look there, it's gonna be more or less the same people generally. Some people are brave and they swap around, but very few. And not only that, you talk to the same people often, most weeks, and that's great. But can I invite you to take a bit of a risk for hospitality's sake? Because Jesus is inviting us to do that, like Priscilla and Aquila, and go and talk to some different people. You will make Jubilee become more hospitable. Can I invite you to do that? Give it a go. Be friendly, be warm, be genuine in, in asking other people questions so that they know that you are interested in their lives as well. I wanna show some photos. Are they coming? No, I don't know if that's the, that's not the right one. Is there, if we go the, to the next one where there's a, a, a group of photos, uh, and there's another one, it might be before or afterwards. Anyway, they'll get to it. Um, I'm gonna carry on, shout if it comes up. Is it there? Not there? Not there, okay, well, I'm just gonna tell you who they are. Because uh, they're here, yeah, Stephen and Ritza are somewhere over there, I saw them. They, um, there they are. They have invited so many people to their house. Um, not all their friends, they've had kids, they've had youth group at their house, they've had young adults and students, they've had burger nights, they've had Mexican evenings. Uh, they didn't organize it, but they said, y'all come. They've had at sometimes over 80 people. People couldn't sit, there wasn't space. Doesn't matter. What about this person? Um, Auntie Yuna. I don't, I don't, is she here? There she is. She's like, if you talk to Auntie Yuna, you just feel loved. I feel so welcome. I feel like, hey, I belong here, even if it's my first time. She's just so hospitable. I love it. It's who she is. The, the lady that was baptizing, Hazel. She, where, is she here? Where is she? Somewhere, oh, there she is. She, she her and her life group um, meet in the, you'll see them after church. They meet in the downstairs hall at the back at a table and kind of, you see them because when everyone else is starting to leave, they caring. Yeah. They are staying there. And because she just, she's gathering. She's hospitable. She's friendly. It's not just her. And there's so many others. Let's be a church that is rising in our hospitability. Is that a word? Hospitality. hospitality. <laughs> I prefer the other one. <laughs> Verse four. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. But Priscilla and Aquila were Jews. Did you hear what that said? Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Priscilla and Aquila are Jews. So they were some of the first two converts in Rome. And the, the Gentiles are grateful to them. This would have been very uncultural for them. As a Jewish couple, you didn't go and invite Gentiles, non-Jews into your home. You didn't eat with them. But Jesus had done something in their lives. This is what he had done. Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. 
Jesus had not just changed this couple's status and identity, he had changed the way that they saw others, the way that they interacted with people that were of a different culture to them. In Ryan Saville's excellent book, Dethroning Race, this is what he says, the world we long for, a place freed from the place of sin, a place without natural disasters and injustice, a place of perfect belonging, free from suffering and poverty, filled with true freedom, love, righteousness, and adventure can be found in Christ. We can look for temporary fixes elsewhere, but the gospel is a clarion call to our deep longing for the new world found exclusively in Jesus Christ. Only in the gospel of the Lord Jesus can we find reconciliation to God as part of the Lord's aims to reconcile all things to himself. This is the comprehensive good news of the new world breaking into our broken world. This is the greater jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, the coming of the kingdom of heaven established on earth right now. This is the gospel. What can we learn from this New Testament couple? That because of Jesus smashing that divided wall, we can be different. There are many dividing walls still in South Africa, aren't there? And the Boca can only do so much. <laughs> but Jesus gives us eternal hope because He continues to work in us. We're not the finished product. And when we start to interact with people who are different to us, we realize that understanding people from different cultures takes, what does it take? It takes time. It takes conversations that take time. And every now and again, it means intentionally walking in someone else's tackies or flip-flops or crocs, or whatever they wear. Being a prophetic people, which is who God has called us to be, shining the light of eternity on our generation now, being a prophetic people is being a little comfortable with some gospel uncomfortableness. Being a little comfortable. In other words, when we step out of our comfort zone and engage and have a conversation with someone who is different to us, like Aquila and Priscilla did, we are okay with that. Because the big comfort in our lives that Jesus has taken our sin away has been dealt with. Verse five, greet my dear friend, Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. So we don't know the details of how Epinetus was converted, but we do know that at one time he wasn't following Jesus and now he is following Jesus. I love that Paul says, my dear friend. He, there's love for him. He speaks fondly of him, which shows that either Paul or someone else invited Epinetus to their life group. They discipled him. He wasn't just left on his own. He was converted. Someone presented the good news to him and then he joined and people cared for him. They said, yo, we wanna see you grow closer to Christ. There's some people that you know who right now, are not followers of Jesus. But in the future, they will become followers of Jesus. Do you wanna be part of that journey? Because Jesus is inviting us to be part of those journeys, part of the process. Verse six, greet Mary who worked very hard for you. It's amazing that Working hard is said in a really positive way. There are so many people in Jubilee Community Church who serve and serve and serve. You work hard, why? Yes, ultimately for Jesus, but you work hard to care for others. And I wanna just honor, there's so many. I wanna just honor a few of those. Alex and Lillian, their photo was up earlier. 
Alex and Lillian serve so many people in different communities. <laughs> Steph and Andre. Steph has run uh, Beauty for Ashes, Hoffa House, where women come out of prison and get rehabilitated to thrive in society. It's hard, and she's been doing that for years and years. Well done. Melvin and Hendrika work uh, at uh, a boy's home uh, just up the road here, Beth Uriel. They serve so lovingly that they have had so many young men in that space. And there's so many others. Let's be people who serve one another, working very hard, building God's church is a beautiful thing. Verse seven, greet Andronicus and Junior, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are, out, they are outstanding among the apostles and they were in Christ before I was. Commentators say that um, Andronicus and Junior were probably a married couple like Priscilla and Aquila. Um, they were outstanding among the apostles, which meant that they would have moved around a bit. They would have preached the gospel. They would have been involved in um, encouraging churches. They would have been involved perhaps in church planting as well, strengthening different churches. And by doing this, they had landed themselves in trouble and they had been sent to jail with Paul. Their faith had led them to take risks for Christ. And they were older than Paul, which meant it wouldn't have been as easy, not that it was as easy at all for Paul. Being in a Roman prison would have meant great suffering. Paul says this in Romans 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Any of you suffering at the moment? There are probably many, many who are suffering in some degree. There's an encouragement here for you today. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Romans 5, Paul says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. My prayer for you today is that you would know the Holy Spirit helping you to know God's love being poured into your heart in your suffering. Tim Keller, who suffered at the end of his life, passed away from cancer not so long ago. As a man who seemed about to lose both his career and his family once said to me, I always knew in principle that Jesus is all you need to get through, but you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Amen. Verse eight, greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord, greet Abanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Stachius. Paul was a man who was affectionate. You can see that he really does love these people and care for them in a deep personal way. What kind of friend are you? Sometimes all of us will come to a, a stage in our lives where we will maybe ask the question, I would like to have more friends or I would like to have some friends who care about me a bit more. Or I would like to have some friends that we can go a little bit deeper with. Can I suggest to you to be that type of friend? It's true that we can't be friends with everyone, but we can care. We can treat people with dignity and with love. There's so many who are brilliant at connecting and caring and befriending in Jubilee. Just wanna, is there a photo? Nongleba, Tricia, they're just so great. Whenever I see them, they are smiling and laughing and, and hugging and connecting 
with people. Let's ask God to help us to be uh, the type of congregation that is not just surface deep, but that we go deeper with one another in building friendship. Verse 10, greets Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. There will be tests in following Jesus. It's not a, a pass or fail. Some of us are watching, some, not of us, some people watch us and are waiting for us to trip up. But even if we do trip up, Jesus is there to catch us. The Holy Spirit is with us. Jesus says in Mark chapter 13, he says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit with us as we walk through life following Jesus step by step. You do not go alone. You have the Holy Spirit going with you. There are so many in this community who are faithful. Rona is the photo. Ken and Joel. Helga and Nick and Antoinette um, have led a life group, a community group in Jubilee for over 20 years. Just like kick on and on and on. And obviously the others, it's been decades faithfully serving God. I wanna be like that. I wanna be like that. How about you? Verse 13, greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. I wanna to speak to some of the older, more mature women in Jubilee. Here is a mother who is not only a mother to her son Rufus, but also to Paul, someone who wasn't her son. If you're an older or even slightly older woman in Jubilee who's been a Christian for, let's say, more than a decade or so, you are a spiritual mother. Listen to this. You are not overlooked by God. You have the unique ability to be able to lead, to pioneer, to care, to shape, to make money, to be creative, to hold family together, to network, to show your emotions in a world that desperately needs more emotions, not less, to raise children that are not even your own children, and also to raise spiritual men and women in Christ. Who was this woman? We don't even know her name, but Paul perhaps honors her in the greatest way. He calls her mother. He calls her mother. If that's you, can I invite you perhaps to step into some of these roles? You are seen by God. You are valued by Him. Then there's this little verse in uh, verse 16 that says, greet one another with a holy kiss. This is not Paul giving teenage um, advice about dating. Um, Michelle has uh, an aunt who lives in Italy and every so often she comes here and she insists a kiss on one cheek and then you know it's coming, a kiss on the other cheek and then you kind of want to pull away and she says, uh -uh, one more and then you've got to go for the third one on the other cheek. In, in this day and age, Paul's day and age, this would have been one of their kind of cultural traditions that they would have kind of embraced and given a kiss on the cheek. And the early church took this tradition on as they embraced it as showing affection to one another. And you see in Paul's other letters that he often does say, greet one another with a holy kiss. And what this is, is I think Paul's saying when we... Maybe that's the music that happens when you greet one another with a holy kiss. <laughs> I don't know. 
Don't try it. <laughs> Expecting the, the music, I don't know. <laughs> I think when we, when we are affectionate with one another, we can't hold grudges. We, we stop having unforgiveness in our hearts when we move towards one another with affection. Paul's not, Paul is not saying that um, we must kind of be on the dodgy side here. He's not saying that at all. He's not talking about men walking around looking for hug, hugging all the single women. No, he's saying let's be brothers and sisters to one another. I'm gonna jump, because we're out of time a little bit. I'm gonna jump to verse 20. It says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. He is a God of peace. He will crush the enemy. It's a, it's a fact. There will be one day where there's no more sorrow and sin. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. You are chosen. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen nation. You are found in Christ. You are a new creation. You are the family of God. You are not a slave. You've been bought into sonship because He is your Father. You are the church of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. You are not forgotten. You are beloved. You are part of the family and you can walk into all the fullness that that is. You don't need pictures on the screen to go to people and honour them. Let's be, a, let's be a, a community that honours one another. You might know people who are serving in, in so many different ways. Why don't you go to them and thank them and honour them and encourage them? And maybe some of these things that we've been looking at in this passage, maybe God is saying, it's your time to step into some of them. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, I wanna thank you so much that we are not just a sea of faces that are unknown. We are precious to you. We are your sons and daughters. We have names that you know. Thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us to really be the body of Christ, to express love for one another and love for the city of Cape Town and beyond, to be hospitable, to really genuinely care for one another, to cross the divide that is up. Lord, won't you help us to be that people that you have called us to be. Lord, won't you help us to be a community that honours one another, that reaches to understand one another in deeper ways. In Jesus' name, amen.